Welcome to First Baptist Church of Walnut Creek. We're studying the book of Revelation. Open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 8. We're going to try to make it all the way through the chapter today, but we have communion also, so I'm not sure if we're going to get through the entire thing, but we'll see. Beginning in verse 1. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. And I saw seven angels who stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. And he was, was given much incense, that he should offer it upon the prayers of all the saints, and upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints, ascended before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with the fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thundering, and lightning, and an earthquake. And the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. And the first angel sounded, and hail and fire followed, mingled with blood, and they were thrown as they were thrown onto the earth. And a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass were burned up. Then the second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. And a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. And then the third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water, and the name of the star is Wormwood. And a third of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died from the water because it was made bitter. Then the fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of them were darkened. And a third of the day did not shine, and likewise the night. And I looked, and I heard an angel flying through the midst of the heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, because the remaining blast of trumpet of the three angels are about to sound. If it's that bad with just the first four, strap on because here comes the next three. Lord, when, we, when we're in the book of Revelation, it is almost too much to bear. It is almost too much to try to process in our minds. So we seek for your direction and your wisdom. We seek for understanding. And we seek for the application of what you want us to do with the truth from your word that we're studying today. What are we supposed to take away from the judgment and devastation that's found here. That's what we're asking for today as we've met together. We've sung some praises to your name. We've reflected upon your glory. And we know that your judgments are righteous and true. So give us that insight today in Jesus' name. Amen. The very first stanza of the song, when the roll is called up yonder, begins like this. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and time shall be no more. Would you recognize the sound of the trumpet when it's called, when it's sounded? How many of you heard the sound of a trumpet? Yeah, everybody's heard the sound of a trumpet. But would you be able to distinguish the sound of a trumpet when it makes the sound? when it gives the blast, could you tell that it's calling you to heaven or it's calling you to dinner? When I was a kid, probably like many of you, you watched old Western movies. There was always some s soldier blasting a bugle and the call was to charge and there was also a different sound to retreat. And maybe you mimicked those as a kid as you were out playing. But did you know that there was also a sound from the bugler for mail call? And everybody recognized that and came out for mail call? There was also a sound for church call. That when they gave the call, hey, it's church time, and everybody came. Well, you know, those who want to come to church 
would come when they heard that sound. It wasn't the same thing as charge or retreat. It had a different sound. And people understood those. Well, now the, Nash, the nation of Israel, they also used trumpets. And the trumpets they used, like the bugle, wasn't brass, it was a ram's horn, like this. And when sounding the horn, the people were able to recognize from the blast of the ram's horn, whether it was a feast or a ceremonial procession or a war or divine judgment. So when a guy stood on top of the hill and was blow making the blast, it wasn't just... It was... They made a certain sound so all the inhabitants could tell, hey, the festival's about to begin. Oh, it's a, Samar a ceremonial procession. Or war is coming. All the men come. Or prepare ourselves. God's judgment is coming. People recognized the sound of the trumpet. When the Bible's talking about a trumpet, this is the idea that sticks in the mind of the Jewish people. The ram's horn. Now, I'm not going to blow that for you. One, because I'm not very good. Two, I might sound like I'm dying. That's not the sound that I wish to give off today. But throughout the Bible, we know that the horns or trumpets were used throughout. Remember in the story of Jericho, where Joshua led the people around the city six days, and on the seventh day, they blew trumpets, and the wall fell. It didn't fall inward, it fell outward. It collapsed because of the judgment of God upon the city. The city was doomed for destruction. And of course, then we have Gideon. Gideon starts off with a mighty army of men of over 30,000 men. And God, through a divine process, is saying it's too big. The army's too big. We need a smaller army. We need fewer people. Wait a minute. That's just the contrary to what we like today. We want more people because more means success. We're bound to have success if we have more. And God says, no, we don't need more. We just need a few good men that will follow me. And finally, they break it down through a process of drinking water, of all things. And they give them the weapons of choice. Every man gets a horn, a trumpet in one hand, and a pitcher with a torch in the other. They divide up into three groups, and they sound the horns. And all the Midianites hear the horns, recognize it, and they run and flee for their lives. We're surrounded by a massive army. Run! Well, when we come to the passage in the book of Revelation, dealing with the trumpet judgments, we have moved through the entire book following the basic outline found in 119, which splits the book into three separate sections. The past, the present, and the future. Remember the past is in chapter 1. The present from John's point of view, and of course our own, our own are dealing in chapters 2 and 3. It's talking about the church. And then chapters 4 through 22, it's all future. All future from John's perspective and from ours. So when we get to chapters 4 and 5, John says, let me show you what heaven looks like and what the throne of God is and what spectacular event is going to take place in which Jesus picks up the scroll from the throne, from the hand of God. And on that scroll, there are seven seals that have to be opened. And in chapter 6, we see Jesus opening each one of these seals. And the seals, as they are opened, horrible judgments unfold and are unleashed upon the earth. It's just completely awful. We can't help but read, these, read the events that take place in chapter 6. And we are just in awe, but the events that transpire are awful on the earth. And the chapter ends with who is able to stand. Well, last week we dealt with that. In chapter 7, answers that. Who is able to stand? We saw there were two groups of people who are able to stand. The Jewish people and a group of Gentile people. One are, is alive while they are standing and the other are dead. One will be alive during the tribulation. The other will die during the tribulation. 
One will stand at the end of the tribulation and one will stand before the Lord God. But they will die during the tribulation. When we read about the seals, the trumpet, and the bold judgments, it can be very confusing because Christians do not agree about the timing of these judgments. Like the horns, when they are sounded, we want to be able to distinguish between what the sounds mean. So, let me share with you what the majority of Christianity thinks about the order of the seal, the trumpet, and the bold judgments. The vast majority of Christianity believes that the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, and the bowl judgments all happen in parallel. Meaning that the seal judgments and the trumpet judgments overlap, and the bowl judgments, you're just reinforcing, you're saying the same thing over and over again. And different words are used to describe the viewing of the same type of judgments. So when you're looking online, or when you're going to some sort of book, the majority of Christianity will say, hey, we think all these things are the same. Because you'll find that there are, they are similar. But things that are similar are not the same. I do not hold, or do I believe, that these run parallel. I think the judgments are progressive. Meaning that after the seal judgments, then comes the trumpet judgments. Then comes the bull judgments. Now, regardless of what you believe or what you think, it's okay to be wrong sometimes. But what is important, and you can't help but notice throughout any of this type of stuff, is that things get worse. By the time you start the Great Tribulation to the end, you can't help but notice things are getting worse horribly, progressively worse. So, when you're reading some things, let me just share some words that I think are important for us to, to point out. Because again, taking with this idea of knowing what the sound is, when you're reading, here's how many people will listen to the judgments. They are, are they concurrent or are they consecutive? Are they simultaneously or concessive? Are they repetition or progression? Are they a recap? Uh, a recap uh, how can I say the word? Um, are they overlapping or sequ uh, sequ sequential? Are they in a parallel form or are they a, do they follow after each other in a chronological time period? Now, when we look at the seal, the trumpet, and the bold judgments, the similarities we cannot help but notice. But that's true when we look at all the judgments. We will see judgments that remind us of the plague judgments that God dealt with delivering the nation of Israel out of Egypt. That does not make these the same ten plague judgments. Because right off the bat, there were ten in Egypt. In the Great Tribulation, there's seven seals, seven trumpets, Seven bulls. And if you were to add them all up, that's 21. That's not 10. And even if you were to say there's, oh, they, are, they are parallel, then you're still talking about seven, and that's not 10. Similarity is not the same. So, regardless, the intensity of things are getting worse. What I look at, and I see, if you're, you have a... You're in chapter 8, verse 1. It says, then he opened the seventh seal. So the seventh seal actually contains seven trumpets. And the seventh trumpet contains seven bowls. It's sort of like the telephoto lens inside of your phone. Everybody can take a regular standard picture, but you also can zoom in and get the picture far away. But it's just one camera. It's just one phone Right? Does that make sense? Okay. But while we're in the passages dealing with all of these judgments, there are also four pauses, four interludes. Chapter 7, verse 1 was the first one. Who is able to stand? There's an interlude there that basically stops and says, 
I need some questions answered. I, I, I need to know more about what's going on. We've got the judgments that's taking place. It's horrible. And then there's a break. There's a pause that expands and explains what's taking place, not with the specific judgment that just took place, but what's going on during the great seven-year tribulation. You'll see another pause that will take place in chapter 10, and another one in chapter 12, and then again, the last one in chapter 17. These four interludes that we will get to and see are going to deal with questions like the Antichrist, the great beast. They will deal with things that are, what's going to happen to the nation of Israel? They're going to deal with, what are, what are people who believe? What's life going to be like during the seven-year tribulation? Ah, well, John explains that. Because the purpose of the book is to reveal Jesus Christ and what's going to take place. So we get to see how his judgments impact people. And we constantly see that there's always an opportunity for people to respond to him. And because of what we know in chapter 7, there are people who respond to Jesus Christ. There are people who will believe that Jesus is the Messiah. They repent and they believe. And it costs them everything. It's a different time period than what we live in right now. It's not the same as America 2022. The freedoms of worship are not the same. So, are you ready to open the last seal and hear the trumpets? I hope that you are, because here we go. So we are going to look at our text and we're going to divide it kind of into two parts. Our passage in chapter 8, as we divide this, we're, we are going to first witness the silence before the sound, and then we're going to hear the sounds of judgment. We will pay special attention to the four trumpets, and we will cover as many of them as possible as time permits. So as we begin, we have silence before the sound. In chapter 8, verses 1 through 6, we start off, it says, Then he opened the seventh seal. Who's the he? Christ is the one who's opened the seals. Remember that. He is the one who's in charge to bring judgment upon mankind. Is he, does he have the right to judge mankind? What gives him the right to judge mankind? You say, well, he's God. and that's, Yes. Did he die on the cross for all man's sin? Did he rise from the dead? Does he not have power over life and death? Well, I'd say yes, according to the word of God that he does. Don't we need to find out from science if that's true or not? See, that's sort of a go-to in our society today. We need to check with science first, do some studies, and then when science says, ladies and gentlemen, that's not what science is about. Science is not, does not find truth. Science affirms truth. Truth is already there. How many of you have already basically known some general facts about things, and then you find out there's a $15 billion study on something? For example, smoking is bad for you. Well, there was a study shown that smoking is bad for you. I didn't need a $15 million study to prove that smoking is bad for you. One of the latest things that they're doing with studying the brain is they're discovering that if you think positive things, if you think good things, you can change the way your mind works. People are blown away by that. You mean if you start thinking, if there's a good rapport, if you think about truth, if you think about what's right, that can change the way that you think? Oh, yes. Studies are starting to come out more and more, and you're going to find out more and more that. Um, the Bible talks about renewing your mind. 
before all these science studies came out, before they could actually take pictures of your brain. The Bible also talks about we should place our mind on what is true, what is good. Think on these things, Paul says. Don't think on the negative things. Think on what true virtue is. Be lifted up on these things. Don't let your mind be dragged through the gutter. See, the Bible has the truth. Science is just affirming what's already there. It has to catch up. Well, going back to the silence before the sound. To begin with, there's a pause. He opens the seal, and there is silence in heaven for about a half an hour. When Christ opens the seal, unlike the previous seals where John hears the sound of judgment, here there is silence. This is not that silence of peace. We're like, hooray, all the fighting is over, and there's cheering. This is that silence of ominous quiet in preparation for God's wrath that is about ready to be poured out in quick succession. You know, in thriller movies, you know that when it's quiet, bad things are about to happen. But there's really no silence. It's just the music changes. It's like eerie quiet. And all of a sudden, you know, don't go into that house. Don't open that door. Don't, don't. It's too late. You did it. And the whole person, you're talking to a screen that can't hear you. Well, Christ opens the seal, and all the four living creatures, the 24 elders, the host of angels, who typically have been constantly praising God and celebrating, are silent for half an hour. We don't like silence. We are uncomfortable with silence. In fact, when people say, I would like to have two minutes of silence, you will start watching people, they will start squirming around in their chair. And they will not keep to the two minutes of silence. Usually after 30 seconds, they'll start talking. We abhor silence. In fact, even when we sleep, we're not silent, we snore. Or at least some of us do. Right. So, there's this pause that takes place. And then we see there's a preparation. In verses 2 and 6, it says, And I saw seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Verse 6, And the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepare themselves to sound. These seven angels that stand before God and were given trumpets, notice they receive them. They don't come with the trumpets, so they get them from God, and they will be used to make announcements of God's judgment. And the angels are preparing themselves. Now, I have no idea what that means. I don't know if they're licking their lips. I don't know if they're preparing the end of the trumpet before it's ready to blast. But it is a great thing of what they are about to do. They're about to deliver a message through this trumpet sound in which it's going to be clear and distinct and the righteous judgment of God is going to fall upon the earth. These seven angels are not the same seven angels that are part of the seals. This is a different group, and they shouldn't be identified with anybody else. They are just God's divine messengers who are coming to serve him at this moment. So we have this pause that takes place as the seals opened in between the seal and the first trumpet blast. The angels are preparing themselves before they... they make the announcement, and then while this is taking place, something important for us, and we would just immediately rush right over it, we have the prayers. In between the silence and the preparation, this important commentary is given to us of what's taking place in heaven. Even during a time of judgment, God still hears the prayers of his saints. We see these angels are accompanying the prayers of the saints with incense that's burning on a golden, uh, golden altar. This reveals to us something about God in regards to our prayers. Throughout the Bible, in the Old Testament, when the children of Israel offered a sacrifice, when they did it correctly, it was considered a sweet-smelling aroma before God. So when they came and they offered a burnt sacrifice... 
The entire animal was burnt up. To God, it was a sweet-smelling aroma. To me, if you've ever smelt something burning, that doesn't smell very sweet. But to God, he would declare that that was done properly and right. It means they were obedient and picking out the right sacrifice. They did it the way he commanded. They followed all of the things that he said in the preparation for the sins, to cover their sins. And God looked at it and said, that's well done. I accept that. I'm pleased with them. I'm pleased with the children of Israel. It was oftentimes you would see incense that would be burnt. And as the incense is going up, that would represent or show a picture of people's prayers going up to heaven. Now, you can't see when people are praying. You don't see a little bubble over their head. You don't see a picture. You don't see where their prayers go. But the incense, you see that burning. You see the little smoke wifting up in the air. And so that picture is constantly there to remind people, see, I... The prayers go up and they dissipate and I receive them. I am aware of them is the idea of what God is saying. But even in the New Testament, Christ giving himself to God as a sacrifice was a sweet smell and aroma acceptable to God. Because when Christ came, he came to do the will of the Father. He didn't come to do his own thing. He came and he followed everything that God the Father had set out for him. Even to the point of going to the cross and dying on the cross. Even when we have those moments where he's praying to God and says, Father, if there's another way, if there's another way we could do this, but not my way, not my will, but yours be done. Can you imagine being at the moment, hours before you know you are going to die? And you're going to face it. It's going to be painful. You're going to suffer. And you have the power to skip out. It's within your ability to open that door and to walk. But you have somebody else who's telling you, that's not what you're here for. You're here to testify. You're here to be the sacrifice. You're here to draw both Jew and Gentile together. You came for this one purpose. That's what everything is about. Your life is about this moment. What is your life about? What is your purpose here? I don't mean here in church at this moment, but I mean your life. Why does God have you here? Paul also speaking to to the church at Philippi. He says, Indeed, I have all and I abound. I'm full. I've received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you. It's a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice and pleasing to God. He's talking about this guy, Epaphroditus. I love that name. And he says, This guy, he delivered the goods that you brought. And God is accepting this as a sweet-smelling aroma. Your sacrifice, church at Philippi, to help me in the ministry is acceptable to God. When we serve one another, that pleases God. When we step out of our comfort zones and we help one, that pleases God. That's an act of service. That's an act of sacrifice. So even in the New Testament, we see... Those type of things are like the prayers going to God. That pleases him. Now, when I mentioned the the picture of the burning incense going up before God, in verse 3, he says that they should offer it with the prayers of all the saints and to the golden, uh, in the golden altar, which was before the throne. When the smoke of the incense, which with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand, when that was complete, The incense that's burning, it doesn't burn forever. It stops. Now, what happens when it's done? He takes coals, 
It's all done. And he takes them and he throws them to the earth. So it's almost like the most important part is done. Now we have to get rid of the stuff that we don't need anymore. Taking those burning coals, he throws them to the earth. And when they hit the earth, there was noises. Some of your, ver- maybe your Bible verses say voices. Thundering, lightning, and an earthquake. Now you've heard this before. You've heard this event take place before. Go, go to chapter 4, verse 5 for just a second. We're going to track a few of these down because we do have time for this. In chapter 4, verse 5, it says, And from the throne proceeded lightning, thunderings, and voices. Now go to chapter 11, verse 19. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of His covenant was seen in His temple. And there was lightning, noises, thundering, and an earthquake and great hell. Now go to chapter 16, verse 18. And there was noises, thundering, and lightning, and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as not occurred since men were on the earth. At each of these times, this, we have the sound of ominous anticipation. God speaks, and the fountains of creation tremble. So we turn back to chapter 8. And why do I have you turn to all these? I wanted you to see that, see, throughout this great tribulation time period, there is this anticipation where God is about ready to do something. And it affects everything. It's almost like God shrugs and the ripple effect impacts all of his creation. Heaven, earth, everything. All of this is taking place just before the sound of the trumpets. It's silent. And God is receiving the prayers of the saints. Now, these are people who died during the tribulation. People who believed and were praying and God's answering their prayers. And then, as soon as that's over, we go to verse 6, and the seven angels who had had, the seven angels who had the seven trumpets, they prepare themselves to sound. And then we have the very first one The first trumpet, bam, it hits the environment. The first angel sounded, and hail and fire followed, and it's mingled with blood, and there was thrown, as they were thrown to earth. It's the picture is almost, it's not like it's naturally falling from the sky, like rain falls. The picture is that this is tossed or thrown down. And that's the word that's used there in the Greek. And it's followed again in verse 8. It's cast its throne and it would be tempting for us not to interpret the trumpet judgments literally but the devastation of these judgments are so severe we have to look at this literally to do otherwise to spiritualize these or to substitute them by any means would to cause us not to take the book of revelation seriously And the whole point of this book is to clarify things, not to confuse them. So in doing so, when we look at this, we first begin, what's the effect? What's the effect? The effect is, during this first sound, is we've got hail, we've got fire and blood that's falling from the sky. Well, that would be pretty daunting. We've all seen hail fall from the sky, but have you ever been in really big hail storms? I mean... It's kind of neat to see little ones, but you're running for your life when they get big and they start denting your car and tree leaves are breaking and you're going, oh my goodness, is this a judgment of God all of a sudden and you're in the middle of it and you're thinking, I hope this ends fast, I hope this ends fast. And you go out and you pick them up. Are they cold? Do they feel like they're burning? Yeah, they do. The picture here is that there's fire and blood falling from the sky. This is a supernatural judgment. It can't be explained by natural means. 
And it says a third of the vegetation is destroyed. The grass and the trees. There's a parallel that we have in the seventh plague. It's found in Exodus. But in this plague, only the people and animals that are, caught, that are outside are killed. So it's not quite the same thing. And the overall impact for a moment, we see that the food supplies, one third of the earth's trees, this is global, this isn't just one area. So some type of global storm is taking place. So we have a third of the earth's greenery is destroyed, the beauty of nature is scarred. And if all the grass, a third of it, is burned up, and a third of the forest is burned up, would it be difficult to breathe? Would you want to be outside because of the smoke? We just had one town, the town of Paradise, that burned down a few years ago. And we just happened to be in the channel of the currents, and it pulls all of that from the north right down in here to the Bay Area. But what if a third of California was all burnt? How long would it take for the atmosphere to clean the smoke away when it's a third of the earth? See, that's how devastating this is. Would it get the world's attention that God is speaking? It's a warning. But yet we still see the mercy of God because it's only a third. It's only a third of this that's destroyed. Food prices will be going up. We come to the second trumpet. The second trumpet blasts. It really affects the economy. The sound of the second angel and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. And a third of the sea became blood. Well, it looks like a great mountain on fire thrown into the sea. Is this a volcano that has exploded and lost its top? Or is this some type of meteor from space? We have no idea. The Bible doesn't describe for us, but it does say that a third of the sea turns to blood, and a third of all sea life, and a third of all shipping is destroyed. Now there's a parallel to the first plague in Exodus, where the river turn, and, and the fresh water turns to blood. Well, what's the impact? Well, the impact of a third of the shipping, if it is destroyed, imagine how are we going to get things from other countries? We're feeling the problem with unloading transportation ships today. And we have them in our port. What do you do when a third of all transportation ships, cruises and so forth, are just gone, just destroyed? A third of the oceans will be polluted by blood and death by the sea creatures. And what trip typically happens when you have something like this happens with a large amount of death, all of those bodies wash to the shore. So all the beach fronts will not be a place you want to go and hang out because as corpses are rotting and dying, it's where diseases take place and pestilence. Will there be a flood? Will there be tsunamis that take place? I don't know. How bad will the beachfront properties be? How long before things are cleaned up? I don't know. But we see that the warning is increasing. The global economy is affected. Will this cause people to turn to God? Will people finally say, now I'm ready to listen to God? Can mankind continually Ignore God? There are some who might say, why doesn't God just talk or send a representative to speak on his behalf? I'm not going to be able to get to, this, to the third and fourth trumpet. I'll do that next week, Lord willing. But let me just say this in answer to that question. In Romans 1.18, it says, The wrath of God has been revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth in in." Their wickedness. People know the truth, but they don't want to believe the truth. People know that there's a God, but they exchange God for something else. But I know this sounds too harsh. 
but it's still true. So let me end the message with a story, like Jesus did for Matthew 21. This is one of his parables. He says, There was a landlord or a landowner who went out to plant a vineyard, and he put a wall around it, and he dug a wine press, and he built it, and he built a watchtower. And then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. And when the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the renters to collect his, his rent, his fruit. Now the tenant seized the servant, and they beat one, and they killed another, and they stoned a third. And then he sent one of his, one of his servants to them, more than the first time, and the sentence treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. And he said to himself, they will respect my son. But when they saw his son, they said to each other, ah, this is the heir of the property. If we kill him, then we can take his inheritance. So they took him and they slew him. Therefore, when the vineyard owner comes, what do you think they're going to do to these renters? He will bring them out. And give that area to another group of people. Wouldn't he? Would he punish those people? I would think so. When we come to communion, are you ready to stand before God?